<laughs> tomorrow? <laughs> well, you're all now. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Um, thank you, and you, you saved me a bunch of bio parts of, of what I was going to say. Um, one thing, let me start off with, I grew up at a very unprogrammed meeting in Sandy Spring, Maryland. Um, arguably barely even Christian, and I, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. So the idea of being asked to give a prepared message is still on the level of alien and closer to terrifying for me. So <laughs> have, have patience with me, please. Um, the reason I mentioned specifically the meeting that I grew up in and describe it as barely Christian is that in my time, in the 70s and early 80s, growing, and I am so thrilled to see young people here, um, growing up in the meeting, you're... You went to RE class, religious education class, during meeting most weeks. But in terms of Christian education, you got handed a Bible when you were in fifth grade and told you should probably read this someday. And then um, at Christmas, we have a Christmas pageant, which basically involves bringing live animals into the meeting house as part of the thing. So the highlight of being in the pageant isn't getting to be Mary and Joseph and the angels and all. That's the drudgery that you do as the punishment for having been in fifth grade and getting to handle all the animals. That's the kid <laughs> thing the kids are looking forward to. You you said earlier, you know, like I'm sure you're gonna recognize the songs. No. <laughs> um we we Sandy Spring is not a singing meeting, yeah. um, and it shows at Christmas pageants. Um, <laughs> You all are much better. Yeah. That's a preliminary in that um, what I want to talk about a little bit today is, of course, what Quaker House is about and what my work at Quaker House is about. But more broadly, what it's ending up meaning for me. And, and part of that has been I spent my childhood thinking I was a lousy Quaker. And I still am. Um, like I said, no real ed religious education. So the idea of being able to speak knowledgeably about what's in the Bible, about what my faith is, that I'm not, I've never been that person. I always joked that God forbid somebody comes and says, I'm having a spirit, a crisis of conscience or a crisis of faith. I'm like, yeah, I'm with you there. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, don't ask me. I'm, yeah, I'm no help. But I keep working for Quakers. I keep running a church. Not was never on my bucket list when I was in college. <laughs> I started at Baltimore Yearly Meetings as the administrative assistant. I'd been home with the kids for many years. The oldest ones were in middle school. The youngest was in elementary school. It was time to start putting some money back in the family coffers. And... The yearly meeting needed somebody to answer the phones and open the mail and all of that. And the kids would get to go to camp, summer camp for free, which at three kids for a, week, a month at camp was, <laughs> that was the thing. So, yes, please sign me up. I thought I was going to do it for a few years just to get back into the workforce and then go and have a real job. <coughs> Twelve years later, I'm running <laughs> the yearly meeting in the middle of a pandemic. And... Um, advocating that our leadership needed to look more like what we wanted our community to look like. It needed to not be a continuing series of old white guys running the yearly meeting. Unfortunately, they listened to me and didn't hire me as the next general, permanent general secretary. <laughs> uh, they selected somebody who identifies visually as female, uses they, them pronouns, and she and her wife uh, have been married for about five years now. They and their wife, excuse me. Um, so the yearly meeting listened to me. Yay! Bad for me. Suddenly I don't have a job. And I got lucky and got to come back into Quaker service at Quaker House. The point of all of this is that I've discovered that the way that I am a, a Quaker, the way that I am to some extent even a Christian, is through my service, through what I do. And I even, just this week, 
separate from knowing that I was coming here, found out that there's even a verse in the Bible about this. And I was shocked. I'm like, hey, I'm going to quote a thing in the Bible. This is weird to me. <laughs> James 2.18. But a man may say, you have faith and I have works. Let me see your faith without your works. And I will make my faith clear to you by my works. I'm not accustomed to reading sections of the Bible and having them mean anything other than a funny story or a, wow, those guys are hypocrites about the beating your wives thing, etc. Having it touch me is not a familiar sensation to me. Having service be a thing of value only now at 56, I tried, my birthday was last month, so I'm, I'm still getting used to the 56 <laughs> number. Mine's in July. It's, is, I'm suddenly realizing how much of my life that is. Young lady was here for the unprogrammed worship earlier. She's having a tonsillectomy this week, um, which I quietly chuckled to myself. When I was a kid, my mom... Um, was a volunteer for Children's Hospital National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. Once a month, she went and did the puppet show. There is not a member of my family who can't quote every single line of the puppet show <laughs> to the point where the people who've married into the family are really sick of it. It was a program, a volunteer program that the hospital ran where children who were going to come and have a procedure at the hospital possibly a major, major life-threatening procedure, were given a tour of the hospital, were shown what everything was, and there was a puppet show that involved a puppet who was going to have a tonsillectomy. Again, this is 1970s. Um, and there were songs, and it explained what a, what this procedure was. And the, the, one of the lines is, I'm going to have a tonsillectomy and I don't even know what that is and I'm scared. I grew up with my mom and then my sister and eventually me being part of that. And it was just the thing that our family did. And when, when she talked about that, you know, for obvious reasons I smiled, but it also made me realize I grew up doing service. I grew up with a family where you just do it. It's just how my family has always expressed our faith. We are not a strongly Christian family. I, again, you know, mom, mom grew up Methodist and the part that she loved about being a Methodist was she got to play the organ. She has never formally joined Quakers because we don't have an organ. <laughs> my dad and I are, dad has passed, dad and I were formal members because in, when I was in middle school, they reinstituted draft, the draft from young men. And it seemed like a really good idea to have down on paper, yeah, I'm really not going. 30 years, 40 years later, I end up running an institution that's 50 years old that came out of individual people saying, we're in the military, but we don't want to be here and we want help getting out. I'm actually going somewhere with this, I promise. <laughs> One of the most special parts about being a Quaker is that there are so few of us. And you get to spend your entire life having people say, oh really, I've never met a Quaker before. And then having to explain what we're about. If you're a kid, like I was, no, we don't have to eat oatmeal every day. Yes, we don't have to wear the funny clothes. Once you get into high school, yes, we're allowed to have the sex. So those are the shakers. We're Question. not Mormons. We're, we're not, not Amish. <laughs> yeah, oh, um, in Maryland, actually, everybody knows the difference between the Amish, the Quakers, and the shakers, yeah. and, and the Mennonites. We, we got all three flavors. Um, but it also, in a way, you end up realizing how much difference our community has made over the centuries when there have always been very few of us and that one person a small group of Quakers a small group of people acting in faith can make a difference eventually 
And the, the, the word service is really, really important. I come from DC. One of the jokes is any social event, one of the first questions you say to somebody is, what do you do? What is your job? You don't identify in terms of what is your religious community, where are you from? It's always, what is your job? And yet we talk about service, not a job. And I think service is a really, really special word. And in a way, it's one I'm fighting. I am trying to get first myself and then others to stop describing people who are in the military as being in the service. I think service is a word that has nobility, has honor. And yeah, Quaker House exists to help support and give relief. I, I, there are so many words, and I'm trying to avoid using so many of them, trying to help people who are in the military survive what they're doing, whether that be help them get out like we do with the GI Rights Hotline, which is where we started, whether it be the counseling service that we have, where we provide free, absolutely free, confidential counseling services. No insurance, no money ever changes hands. There are no records that aren't confidential. So no one can ever ask my counselor, what did you do? What did this person who's in special forces talk to you about? So that they can help deal with the moral injury, the PTSD, the abuse that they suffer and sometimes inflict because of their experience in the military. And my job, to try to put myself out of business, to try to serve the wider world. We, in the song we talked about, you know, trying to create a world of peace. I would love to put myself out of a job. Unfortunately, it's not gonna happen in my lifetime. Service is done because it's something that's important, because it's something that brings that honor. And in the best worlds, you don't expect reward. You don't expect to be recognized. This week, of course, everybody's been talking about Martin Luther King. I'm from DC. We talk about Bayard Rustin, the gay African-American Quaker who did so much to make the 63 March on Washington happen. Nobody knew about him at the time. Nobody in the wider world, of course, there were people who knew what he did then. And it's only now, in the 2020s, in the 2010s, that he's been getting recognition for what happened, long after he died. That was service. That was true service in faith, never expecting to get recognition in fact, receiving abuse. The reason that he stopped being known as the person who organized it was because of the homophobia, the prejudice against him that made it, un made it impossible for him to be recognized then. The service that Sarah Galuli, the new General Secretary of Baltimore Yearly Meeting is doing as a person who identifies on the LGBT spectrum arguing with old Quakers every single day. Yes, you really, I really do want you to use they, them pronouns when you talk about me. That that has value and having to have the patience when those old friends forget. And sometimes even the person who she repla they replaced. Um, one of my children just started using they, them pronouns one month before they graduated from college last spring. I hadn't seen them until I got to college. So I said, you know, look, Thomas, it's only been a month. I've been your dad. I've spent 22 years practicing calling you he. Have some patience with me. And, and they were really good about it. You have to be patient. You have to recognize that your individual service will make a difference, can make a difference, without your ever knowing it. You have to have faith that service will make a difference. That's what I'm trying to do. Still working on the faith part. Reasonably good about the service part. Um, it's the support of meetings like Winston-Salem Winston -Salem meeting, 
like Chapel Hill, where I'm going next week, first friends that I was at a few weeks ago, that makes all the difference. It makes it possible for one guy living by himself in a house in Fayetteville to be able to be there, to be a place of peace in that town and hopefully making a difference in people's lives and having faith that eventually that world of peace that we sang about will come about. Sadly, probably not in my lifetime, maybe in your all's, I hope. That's, I, I don't know how to end what I'm saying other than to say that faith has to be where you start, even if you don't know that you have faith. Even if you grew up a lousy Christian at Quaker meeting in Sandy Spring. Thank you.